confronting false prophets. Last week, we looked at how Barnabas and Saul made their way. Led by the Holy Spirit, they came to an island called Cyprus. Um, and they went to a place where at least one of them was known. Remember, Barnabas was from Cyprus. And we talked about how, you know, he had family and probably friends there. And if people who know you don't believe that you're different, why on earth would you think you could go elsewhere and, and, and be effective? Now, I didn't say accept what you believe. We never read about Barnabas' family accepting Christ as their Savior. We, we just don't know. It's not recorded. But what I meant to say is, does your family recognize that there's something different about you since you came to Christ? They should, because the Bible says we are a new creation and that the old has passed away. In fact, he doesn't just say the old. He says, behold, behold has passed away. So we got to remember this. These guys proclaim the gospel first to the Jews and then to the Gentiles. And today we're going to look at the continuing journey. We'll look at two results of their ministries and the opposition to the gospel as well as salvation from hearing the Lord's word. Let's turn to Acts 13.6. Acts 13.6. Now I have to remind myself I can touch everything because... No one comes up here. <laughs> so this is weird. Ah. So Acts 13, 6, it says, When they had gone through the whole island as far as Paphos, they came upon a certain magician, a Jewish false prophet named Bar-Jesus. He went through the whole island. Remember how big Cyprus is? A hundred miles by 60 miles. You know, that might take me, what? Two months, three months to get through. I don't know, probably took them because in that age, you know, they probably did it in a day or two. I, I don't know. But that's a, to me, that's a huge island. Um, what's 100 miles from here? New York City? You know, yeah. Lo New York City and, and what's 60 miles. So think of that kind of space. And they're going through witnessing to that area. Um, and up to this point, everything seemed to be smooth sailing, except we're not told of any conversion. Did you notice that? There's no, we're not told of any conversions, that they were just going around into the whole island. Not only are we not told of any conversions or dealings, frankly, with anyone. We're not told about Barnabas' family or his friends. We're not told of any interactions. In fact, we're not even told about any confrontations up to this point. Remember, they went through the whole island. These guys were going to synagogues, talking about Jesus Christ as the Messiah in Jewish synagogues. And we don't read of anything. We read nothing. There's crickets. You know, just that chirp, chirp, you know. So did conversions happen? Most likely. So you might ask, why aren't they mentioned? Why, why, why isn't more stuff mentioned here? Again, remember, Luke couldn't just say new page. He couldn't say, you know, line break here, let's just keep typing. The book of Acts is limited by the size of the scrolls. The maximum length of a scroll in that day was between 32 and 36 feet. That would be four times however many of these. <laughs> I don't remember. I can't do that math in my head. I, was go I just thought of that. That's how I always measure things. But if that's one of these is four feet long, think of what 36 is. It's probably to a soundboard. That's how long it can be. Right to there. Okay, so from here to there, that's the length of a scroll. And it's only wrote on one side. If they wrote on the other side, it, it wasn't effective. So anyone know there's two other books in the New Testament that reach the maximum length, which Acts did? Anyone know which two they are besides Acts? What? No, 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 in the New Testament. No. No, Matthew and Luke. Now, here's the funny thing. Remember Acts, when we started Acts, Acts is the second volume of the letter that Luke started in the book of Luke. So that means that he was already up to, he was a two-scroll guy. Um, and uh, could you imagine him saying, oh, I, could I do a third? He probably could. And 
remember, Acts ends, a spoiler, on a cliffhanger. You know, Acts ends just very abruptly. Um, so these scrolls were not easy to manage. Because I'm telling you, if you roll out a scroll, this wasn't like, you know, rice paper that you could roll up nice and neatly. I mean, some Bibles, that, especially some of those old ones that we have back there, where they printed on the rice paper, it's amazing how thin they can get it. And it's a whole Bible. No, these were on papyrus. And, and, um, and there's another, it's a, a reed like uh, thing from a paper like product made from reeds. Um, and, so, and so you'd think, you know, <laughs> look at the book of Acts. If you had to say, okay, I know the book of Acts, what am I going to cut out in order to include what happened in Cyprus? What are you willing to cut out? Can it cost? No, it can't get, can't get rid of Samaria. You know, he was under constraint. So, you know, we can't cut things out from there. So that's why we're probably not told. We have to trust God. We have to trust God. What he said through Isaiah in verse 55, uh, or chapter 55, verse 11. God said, so shall my word be that goes out from my mouth. It shall not return to me empty, but it shall accomplish that which I purpose and shall succeed in the thing for which I sent it. So we likewise have to believe that while Barnabas and Saul were proclaiming the gospel, God's word was not returning empty. We have to trust that God's word is not a work of man, but of God. It's not, this book is not just a, a man, you know, 40 different authors putting together something over 1,500 years saying, oh, this is a good thing to talk about. In 2 Timothy 3, verse 16 and 17, it says, All scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. So we have to trust that it's about God. It's not about us. And the Bible is meant to equip us. That, that's the only authority that we have is the authority of God's word. Um, and just as certainly, conversions should be expected. When witnessing occurs, there will no doubt be opposition to a gospel. See, just as sure as, as you can say, hey, you know, there were conversions, there were probably also conflicts. We have to remember that just as there's a God who is out there that loves us, he has an enemy who hates us. And those followers may look like us, but they're not like us at all. Let's turn to Matthew 13. Matthew 13. And look at 24 to 30. Matthew 13, 24 to 30. You, in the King James, it's called the parable of the tares. Here in the ESV, it's the parable of the weeds. Um, Matthew 13, verse 24. He, and that's Jesus, put another parable before them, saying, The kingdom of heaven may be compared to a man who sowed good seed in his field. But while his men were sleeping, his enemy came and sowed weeds among the wheat and went away. So when the plants came up and bore grain, then the weeds appeared also. And the servants of the master of the house came and said, Master, did you not sow good seed in your fields? How then does it have weeds? He said to them, An enemy has done this. So a servant said to him, Then do you want us to go and gather them? But he said, No, lest in gathering the weeds you root up the wheat along with them. Let both grow together until the harvest. And at harvest time, I will tell the reapers, gather the weeds first and bind them in bundles to be burned, but gather the wheat into my barn. Wherever the gospel of God is sowed, the weeds of the enemy are planted right alongside the good plants. Plants that are placed there by the enemy. Weeds that were only revealed to be weeds when the good fruit is bearing fruit, or good plants are bearing fruit. 
You see, whenever God plants good seeds, the enemy plants weeds. And there's some things about weeds. If you're a gardener, you know about them. They take up space. They will choke out other plants. Weeds consume the field's resources. They suck the resources dry out of the soil. Weeds bear no fruit. They're not useful for anything. But also weeds that will not be, these weeds that we're reading about won't be removed until Christ comes again. And he harvests his, the, the, the rapture happens or the uh, great white throne judgment. I'm not sure which one they're referring to. But at that point, the weeds, which represent Satan's children or lukewarm Christians or people who think they can scoot by, are going to be gathered up and they're going to be burned. Whereas Christians will be harvested and taken to heaven. And so, just as it's expected that conversions are going to happen when people go on missions trip, weeds are also going to be exposed. Confrontations will occur. So with that in mind, in today's passage, we're going to read about a confrontation and a conversion. See, as they traveled to Cyprus, it says that they came across a magician. Now, this wasn't David Copperfield. He wasn't in the process of sawing a woman in half. He wasn't playing, pulling coins out of kids' ears. No, the word that's used for magician there is the word mogos. And it's a singular form of magi. Where, where we heard magi from? The, the three, we three kings. Um, the kings, the three kings that visited or the three wise men that visited were magi. These were men whose title literally comes from ancient Persia. They would come from the time of Daniel. Uh, and they were known for their study of two things, real sciences like astronomy, agriculture, mathematics, and history, but also less scientific things like astrology and interpreted of dreams. These were men of intelligence by that world standard. And they were astute in wielding political power. They were in the courts of kings and governors, and as we'll see, the proconsul of Cyprus. The proconsul is just another way. It's a governor, but he doesn't answer to the emperor. He answers to the, the Senate. Um, and so they were in the courts of people for one very good reason, because they had a lot of knowledge. And they were assumed to be wise people. And Luke records that not only was this man a magi, but he was Jewish. Now, there's a problem. If you're Jewish, you were strictly forbidden from being a magi. You know, by Old Testament law. So what we gather from that is while this man accepted his heritage, while this man said, hey, I'm Jewish, he chose to live according to his own way and not what the scripture says. He carried the trappings of his heritage, still identified as being Jewish, regardless if his life and profession denied the very thing he said he was. Josephus actually records, he's a Jewish historian, said that magi were actually very valued by the Romans uh, for their courts and for their um, for counsel because they were, had insight to a Jewish mindset. Because remember, the Romans had many gods, and for the Jews, it was very odd because for the Jews, they had one god. And so the Romans never really knew how to handle them, so that they would look for Jewish people to, to be in their courts. This Jewish man is also identified as a false prophet, someone who claimed to speak with the authority of God, but who was really just speaking by his own authority, and this was not a new thing. Remember what God told Jeremiah about the false prophets of his day. Jeremiah 14, 14 says, And the Lord said to me, The prophets are prophesying lies in my name. I did not send them, nor did I command them, or speak to them. They are prophesying to you a lying vision, worthless divination, and the deceit of their own minds. False prophets were around way back then, truly had the appearance of godliness. They looked the part. They spoke with all the right words. The problem was it was their words. It wasn't God's word. 
And that makes all the difference in the world. And one of the names this man uh, went by, because we'll see that he's went by two, is Bar Jesus, which literally means the son of Jesus. And remember, Jesus is a transliteration of the Hebrew word Joshua. They both mean the same thing. Jesus was a common name at that time. So when people say, oh, we found a tomb that says, you know, Jesus and his wife, it's not about Jesus Christ. Jesus was like like Bill was like 40 years ago. I don't know what the new one is. It used to be Jonathan, and there's always groups of names. But Jesus was a very common name. Um, it means, oh, well, does anyone here know what it means? What, M? God says or Yahweh says, absolutely. Um, that's what it means. When, when you read Jesus or Joshua, they mean the same thing. Yahweh saves, or God saves. And so this magician had a Jewish heritage. He had a really deceptive name, though it was great. You know, he's the son of Yahweh who saves. And Bar Jesus was in the court of another man who Luke now introduces us to in verse 7. I didn't put the bookmark. Okay, Luke 13, 7. He was with the proconsul Sergius Paulus, a man of intelligence who summoned Barnabas and Saul and brought to hear the word of God. The proconsul, as I said, was effectively the governor. It's just who they answered to. Um, and for the longest time, one of the, uh, the mockers of the Bible said, well, that, that this was, wasn't a proconsul. He had to be a governor. Well, it turns out they found coins that were stamped uh, Sergius Paulus proconsul. So it was, in fact, the Bible is, is accurate. Um, but he was in charge of all Cyprus. And, you know, we're introduced to him. The only thing they say about him is he was a man of intelligence. He, he wasn't just like your run of the mill, you know, guy that just knows who to, you know, bump arms with. He was a man of intelligence. And one thing about really intelligent people, they're always seeking more knowledge. Have you ever noticed that? Have you ever met anyone that was very intelligent? They always want to know more. They always want to learn more. I think it's why their brains keep working. Uh, sometimes we settle, and then you're done. And not only that, but he was a man who must have heard about Barnabas and Saul's ministry. Remember, this was his island. He was responsible. And, you know, you have... Two people going around to synagogues and to the Gentiles proclaiming a gospel message. It got back to him about, hey. And because they were teaching in synagogues, you got to wonder, hey, are these two more Jewish teachers that I can get to, you know, work for me? Uh, you know, he had one in Bar Jesus, and maybe, you know, he wanted to see what others were thinking. And so the proconsul heard this and, and said, you know, I hear you speak the word of God. I want to talk to you. Um, and remember, remember the island. Cyprus was, was beautiful on the outside. Physically, it was a beautiful land. What was it called? The Happy Isle. Because if you lived there, you'd never have to leave because it was a perfect place. But while it was beautiful physically, it was dark spiritually. And what would follow, and this is a trivia if we ever have a trivia night, is a first recorded presentation of the word of God to the Roman world, to a Roman leader. And what we'll, we'll see will happen is that Paul wanted to make a clear distinction between Christianity and everything else. The, the proconsul was thinking, hey, I want to hear the word of God from these Jewish teachers, and Paul is, no, this is about the gospel. And that's that. And while the proconsul was looking forward to hear Barnabas and Saul speak, not everyone was happy about this invitation. You see, no matter how miserable things may be, no matter how horrible a person's condition, there are always going to be people who wish to maintain the status quo, want to maintain their position, want to keep things familiar, moving in the patterns that they can maintain and manipulate. And now, Bar Jesus, is, we're getting his other name. In verse 8, but Elimas, the magician, for that is the meaning of his name, opposed them, seeking to turn 
the proconsul away from the faith. Elimas is a transliteration of a word which means the interpreter of dreams. You know, huh. So now he's got son of the living God, son of, of the God of salvation, and interpreter of dreams. Whew. Uh, he had a reputation that he could interpret people's dreams. So not only was he a false prophet, but he was a counterfeit prophet. Think about the Old Testament people, the prophets back then, who interpreted dreams. Daniel, Joseph, the son of Jacob. These were, these were people. And here we have Bar-Jesus, who also interpreted dreams, but he was a counterfeit. Because if he didn't speak for God, he didn't interpret dreams based on what God did. And he didn't want anything to do with the gospel. More importantly, he didn't want the proconsul to have anything to do with it either. The word resist is a strong word. <coughs> and so while Barnabas and Saul were doing the work of their master, Jesus, Bar Jesus was doing the work of his master, Satan. Satan is the enemy who planted the seeds of the weeds. And this man was focused on his master's wishes, which is stopping the gospel in any way possible. You see, Bar Jesus heard the gospel. He recognized the danger to his position because of what the gospel contained. He, as trusted advisor to a proconsul, would know that the proconsul would be looking at and would accept. No doubt he understood the implications of having a Christian proconsul. A proconsul who Instead of seeking Bar Jesus's or Elimas's advice, would now turn to God and seek God's advice, and that was not in Bar Jesus's you know best interest. But notice what his method was. He didn't outright attack Paul and Barnabas, or Barnabas and Saul. We're still in the Barnabas and Saul phase. We'll get to Paul and Barnabas. It was a not. It didn't seem to be attack on them to their face, but. At the end of verse 8, it says, seeking to turn the proconsul away from the faith. He went to a proconsul and attempted to, to kind of gently nudge him away, you know, before anything took hold, um, which he means he was already on his way to belief. He was already looking uh, on this. And Bar Jesus knew it. Um, we are not told how Elimas sought to prevent this. Maybe it was, you know, I, when I read that passage, I was thinking of in, in the Lord of the Rings movie where the, the character Wormtongue whispered to the king's ear, like, oh, this guy, you know, you, he always causes trouble. And, the, oh, you always cause trouble. That's how I was picturing this man to be. Um, and, you know, maybe it was a whisper in the ear. Maybe it was a doubt that he cast. You know, I heard, you know, he caused some problems in some of the synagogues. Oh, you know, he was kicked out of Damascus. Um, Maybe he spoke from an intellectual point of view. And, you know, really, Proconsul, if, if he's talking about the Son of God dying, how does a God die unless he's not really a Son of God? And, you know, he's trying to take the intellectual point of view uh, of saying things. And now we see how God's children are to handle confrontation. In verse 9, but Saul, who is also called Paul, was filled with the Holy Spirit, looked intently at him. Notice at this point, Saul got his, another name mentioned to him. He has another name too. Um, and this is the first mention of Paul. You know, so you see Saul in the New Testament and Paul, same person. And I always wondered why that was. And I read a number of things. I actually read someone was saying uh, about how, you know, Saul took his name Paul from the guy for his first convert. Remember what was Sergio's name? Paulus. Uh, that doesn't make sense. It really doesn't make sense because, you know, he wasn't saved at that point when he took the name. So another people said that Saul means uh, Paul means small in Latin. Um, and so Saul went from being a king to being small. Again, not sure about that. But actually, Paul is this Roman name. Uh, and since Paul was going to be visiting a lot of Roman places, it was the easier and more better to talk to him with his, based on his name of Paul, a Roman name. 
not a Hebrew name. Because again, it wasn't about, while, while Jesus was a Hebrew, he's talking Christianity. He's talking followers of Christ. New creations. He didn't want people getting trapped in, uh, well, we have to become a, a Jew first and then become a Christian. No, this is new. So he started using his name, Paul. And I think that was more reasonable to think. Um, so, but his name is not important. It's about who was controlling him. It says, being filled with the Holy Spirit. Paul was not going to let this evil man intimidate him. You know, I picture this when, you know, they're standing there and, and Elimas is, is doing whatever he's doing to deflect. And Paul's just looking straight at him. Uh, and it's an old fashioned stare down. Remember, Jesus said about the Holy Spirit when we stood before rulers and such. In Luke 12, verses 11 and 12. And when they bring you before the synagogues and the rulers and the authorities, do not be anxious about how you will defend yourself or what you will say. For the Holy Spirit will teach you in that very hour when you ought to say. And here's what we see happen. You can almost hear as Paul hears the Spirit as he's staring at this man, as he's looking at this man. In verse 10, he says, and he said, you son of the devil, you enemy of the all righteousness, all full of all deceit and villainy. Will you not stop making crooked the straight path of the Lord? OK, this is not a wimpy kind of response. Paul didn't mince any word. He didn't, you know, he wanted to be sure that uh, the spirit's judgment that was going to be pronounced. He wasn't looking to find common ground and say, well, you know, Ellie Miles, you know, I understand you, you're, you're Jewish and, and, you know, so am I, but, you know, let's find some common ground. There is no common ground between God's seed and Satan. The only thing we have in common between us and the unsaved world is our starting points. We all are born rebels, rebels against God until we're saved by God's grace. As 2 Corinthians 5.17 says, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. When you become a Christian, your past is your past. Leave it behind. People say, well, you know, my life is like this. It keeps the ups and downs and and I keep falling into sin, and I get say I ask for forgiveness. I keep going, and it never changes. I never grow. Part of it is because they don't let go of their past, and so they're chained to it. And you keep going. If you're chained to something, you just go in circles around that thing. God's broken the chain at Calvary. You're not tied to that anymore. You're a new creation. That old has passed away. It's dead. And yes, you're gonna slip at, in the sin. You need to repent of it and move forward. Behold means pay attention. Pay attention. The new has come. There's no place for a Christian to compromise their faith with the unsaved world. Jesus said in Matthew 12, 30, whoever is not with me is against me, and whoever does not gather with me scatters. There is literally nothing a true believer has with the uh, people of the world. If you are not completely submitted and committed to Jesus, you are committed and submitted to his enemy. You're a tear. A person, a weed, is twisted by their beliefs, twisted to believe that a baby inside a woman is not a baby. We heard that a lot yesterday at the prayer march. Not in anger or hate, but um, Martin Luther King's niece said, we believe in a God that loves us from the womb to the tomb. Uh, what a beautiful image. Um, the twisted to believe that man's ways are higher or in some cases equal to God's way. The Bible says this is a sin. Man says, no, it's not. Who do you believe? If you're a Christian, you say, I believe God's word. The ways of Satan and his people are round about and crooked. They make things harder than they should be. And we have to be quick to deal with sin and sinners in the body. Because it can spread like cancer. 
So he first corrects his name. He says, you're not the son of Jesus. You're the son of the devil. You're the son of the accuser. He was the enemy of all righteousness. Literally, you are the enemy of everything that's right. Remember what I said. This is the first time that the Roman government officials heard the word of God and the gospel. But Paul doesn't stop there. He continues to lay out bar Jesus. He says, you're full of deceit. And we say, oh, deceit, you know, he's a used car salesman. But the Greek word there is dolos, and it really meant bait. He says, you know, you're full of bait, something used to trap or snare the unsuspecting. That's how Elimas came across. You're a man of great wisdom. Look at all my titles. Look at all I am. But it was all a trap. It was the trap for the pro council. It was the trap that anyone came in contact with. They'd be trapped by his wisdom, by his knowledge. And the word translated villainy is translated, it really means mischief. He says, you're not only someone who baits people to, to follow you, but you're also full of mischief. You see, Paul recognized who Elimas was. And he didn't want this to continue. Elimas was trying to lead the proconsul astray to get him, you know, he saw where the proconsul was heading. Maybe it was the questions the proconsul was asking. But he knew that the proconsul was going to turn. And he was, really didn't want that to happen. And then in verse 11 of Acts 13, the Spirit through Paul passes judgment on Elimas. Paul says, and now, behold, again, behold means you better be paying attention. The hand of the Lord is upon you, and you will be blind and unable to see the sun for a time. Immediately, mist and darkness fell upon him, and he went about seeking people to lead him by the hand. God, through Paul, passes judgment. And, you know, sometimes God's judgment takes a long time. You know, the people of Israel were following after other gods in the promised land, the gods of the people they conquered. God kept bringing them back, bringing them back, warning them, saying, hey, things are going to be bad. You're going to be removed from the land. They kept doing it, and eventually they went. They were taken from the land. And other times his judgment comes swiftly, like Ananias and Sapphira who lied about how much money they were giving. And what happened? Boom, he died. She comes in, and Peter says, hey, you know, is this how much you got for the land? Yes. Boom, she's dead. And it wasn't the amount of money. It was that they lied about it. And now here's Elimas. You're blind. Paul reveals that God's hand was upon him and that he would lose his eyesight for a season. This was still symbolic of his real spiritual state. In John 3, 19 and 20, Jesus said, And this is a judgment, that light has come into the world and people love the darkness rather than the light, because their works were evil. For everyone who does wicked things hates the light and does not come to the light, lest his works should be exposed. And so Elimas was placed into darkness, and yet God showed him mercy. He showed him mercy. He said, you're going to be blind for a season. He went from seeking power to seeking just someone to take his hand and lead him away. But he was given hope that it wouldn't be permanent. And do you see something familiar with Elimas' punishment? Remember how God's judgment came upon uh, Paul or Saul on the road to Damascus? He lost his eyesight for a season. So you've got to wonder, was Paul hoping that at some point Elimas would, would come to the saving faith? And now we read the proconsul comes to faith in Jesus. After the miracle in... Um, Oh, verse 12. Then the proconsul believed, then he saw that he had what had occurred, for he was astonished at the teaching of the Lord. The proconsul comes to saving faith. It wasn't the miracle that did it. It was the miracle that confirmed what they said was true. He, he wasn't astonished as much by a miracle, but it says he was astonished by the teaching of the Lord. That word for astonished means being driven out of your mind. This man, the highest-ranking Roman official, 
to be converted by Christianity ever in the New Testament is recorded, was blown away, not because he just saw someone lose their sight, though that did authenticate what he heard. Remember, God does not want us coming to him because of miracles. Miracles happen. They still happen. But if you come to Christ because of a miracle, eventually you're going to want another miracle and then another miracle. Our, mir- our faith is based on faith, based on who Jesus is. Sergius was blown away and came to believe, and that word for believe is our old friend, pistuo, which means commit to. It's saying that when you say you believe in God, what you're really saying is I commit everything to him. I commit my life to God. I submit everything I had. We heard uh, Kat talk about that first uh, part of the first line of the 23rd Psalm. And I'm excited, I'm excited about that and what it meant to her. The for me, the first thing about that for me was the Lord. We in America don't understand what a Lord is anymore. We kicked them out 200 years ago. Uh, but the Lord, you didn't say to the Lord, well, no, I don't agree with you because you'd lose your head or at least part of your body. It, you, we, your Lord told you to do something. You didn't question him. You didn't hesitate. You did. So when you read, the Lord is my shepherd. Our almighty God is our shepherd, and he leads us. So today, there are always going to be tares. Tares look like Christians. But look and listen to the people around you. There are people who claim to be Christians. And they're going to do two things a tear does. A tear does not submit to the Lord. A tear consumes the resources. In the midst of large resources or short resources, uh, they consume. Uh, if you have a lot of resources, they consume a lot. Uh, Attila was talking about that one pastor who has three Lear jets. You know, I have a RAV4. Um, and... But that man is a tear. He consumes the resources. They cause people to stumble and fall away. And they'll do so to protect their position. And they bear no fruit. They still answer to their master, the one who planted them. And so they tend to be people who distract and twist the truth. They cause dissension or participate in dissension of the body. You know, today as I was reading this, Cyprus sounds a lot like America. The beauty of this land is amazing. Uh, Mr. Tubal's son is driving cross-country in a minivan with two other guys. Um, and he's been posting on YouTube uh, these videos. And it's kind of funny you know, to watch it. Andy, Andrew Tubal. Um, but the, he's uh, Grand Teutons now is where he's at now. Um, and he's showing how you sleep, you know, three guys in a minivan and they just have hammocks they set up. Um, but... Spiritually, America is darker today than it was yesterday. Christian has become a title. It's become a position. It's not a place of service. We're called to be servants of the living God. And watching that prayer march yesterday where people didn't get together to protest or represent political parties just to pray, to find to, to the only final authority of this land, a phrase just kept coming up, which people were asking God for forgiveness. They were asking forgiveness for themselves. Pastors who were, were, were quoting Bible verses about forgiveness. People were asking forgiveness for our land. And one of the big things that came up is how we so freely murder innocent babies because of their location. And so many of our populations are under the control of pseudo-Christianity or under the control of weeds, of Satan. People who say that they're Christians but who instead of opposing the world and its values seek to accept it or compromise, just like Bar-Jesus. There are many people who approve of the thing, ways of the world. Oh, they say, we won't support it. Actually, I had someone once say to me, you know, I don't personally support abortion. I want them to be rare, but I vote for people who do. So you support abortion. No, no, I just vote for people who do. Uh, to me, that makes no sense. And that's part of the twistedness of the world. Satan and his workers are indeed still here and, and moving. 
Satan wishes to crush and destroy mankind. He's never a man's friend because we're creating God's image. And yes, sometimes he will use different means of distracting people from the gospel. Sometimes, have you ever noticed that when you sit down and you say, I'm going to study God's word, people call, your computer bings, or all of a sudden your computer locks up and you, what, what? Um, you read about a church scandal, someone mentions fear. Other times he uses a more direct approach. Sometimes Satan will use lions to feed Christian, to be fed to, uh, Christians, or the Crusades, or the Spanish Inquisition. And you might say, well, wait a minute, Pastor. Those last two, they, well, they were done by Christians. <laughs> no. Let me ask you, could a true representative, a little Christ, torture someone and justify it and say, well, I'm just trying to make them a Christian? Of course not. Um, or could they sack their own city, the capital of Constantinople was sacked by the Third Crusade, you know, and that was the capital of Eastern Christians. And he still uses bait to trap people in sin. You know, Satan's flexible when he attacks. He doesn't always attack in the same way. You know, as I was thinking about abortion, abortion's an evil sin, one that ends a human life. But, you know, Satan plays the other side, too. Oh, those evil people who've had abortions. Oh, those rotten doctors. You should go shoot one. You know, that, that, God will make be happy about that. He deludes people into attacking people who have done it, convinces them that they're right to hate people who in Planned Parenthood. Let me make something clear. In no way does that mean we hate people who have had abortions or even those who commit them or perform them. We hate the sin, not the sinner. We are called to love our neighbor as ourselves. Imagine the burden that someone who's had an abortion carries. They'll never, they, for many of them, they, they would hesitate to come to saving faith because they know what they did. You know, people, I, I think they, they said this in the 80s, that people in the 70s didn't know that a baby was a baby inside of a mother. But now they know. With all the pictures and images, they know. People aren't ignorant. So we need to still extend God's love to them, embrace them. The Alight uh, Pregnancy Center in Hudson will counsel people uh, on this. You know, there, there are people on waiting lists for, for this. But in the same breath, we cannot back down from the idea of calling it. It is a sin. It is murder. Satan and his followers, unlike in the movies, he doesn't have a penchant for a penchant for uh, red satin. Uh, he doesn't always wear a black hat. In fact, sometimes Satan looks very pure, very holy. Let's flip over to 2 Corinthians. We haven't done many finger exercises today. 2 Corinthians 11. 2 Corinthians 11. And we'll look at verses, uh, oh, we'll start in verse 10. That's always a good place to start. 2 Corinthians 11, start in verse 10. As the truth of Christ is in me, this boasting of mine will not be silenced in the regions of Achaia. And why? Because I do not love you? God knows I do. And what am I doing I will continue to do in order to undermine the claim of those who would like to claim that in their boasted mission, they work on the same terms as we do. For such men are false apostles, deceitful workmen, disguising themselves as apostles of Christ. And no wonder, for even Satan disguises himself as an angel of light. So it is no surprise if his servants also disguise themselves as servants of righteousness. Their end will correspond to their deeds. I repeat, let no one think me foolish. But even if you do, accept me as a fool so that I too may boast a little. You see, Satan weeds don't look like weeds. Remember, they're in the church. They look very holy. They look very pure. They probably even go out and witness, but they whisper witness a different gospel. And they push people around to control them. Please understand, this was not and is not a battle between Paul and Elimas. 
This wasn't their bat this wasn't their battle between two men. Ephesians 6 12 says, For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over the present darkness, against spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Your battle is not with your president. Your battle is not with your speaker. Your battle is with Satan. And you have to remember that. Um, one of the things I keep telling people is don't just vote against someone. Look at what you're voting for. As we're, You believe it? In, in less than a month or about a month we're going to be voting? I can't believe it. So, so today, remember, it's not you. When you witness them, we heard a number of people say that they've witnessed to people during praise time. All you have to do is witness. It's not your job to save people. Your job is to sow the seeds, spread the word, and live a life that they can't look at you and go, wait a minute. You say this, but I've seen you do that. Well, well, well. No. We are called to witness, and it's God who brings them to Jesus, not you or I. We are saved by grace through faith. And that's the bottom line. So when we leave here, absolutely go out and witness. But make sure your life lines up with them. And you're going to meet. Don't think it's just going to be all rainbows and butterflies as you witness to people. I mean, we didn't hear anyone, you know, the plumber didn't pick up a pipe and swing it at a tiller and say, oh, yeah, we well, can't do this. You know, no. Sometimes they will. I Hopefully not. But. Sometimes they won't. It's all about God's timing. Share the word. Share the gospel. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for your word. We thank you, Lord, that you paid the price for our sins. Lord, work in, in each of us to be ready at a moment's notice to share your word. And not just in our words, but the way we live our lives. Let it just be a, a continuous sharing, Lord. And, and, Lord, just work in us as we go through this week. Again, we ask that you open our eyes to, to the opportunity to share your gospel. And with whoever you put in our way, even if they look like they're not savable, Lord, none of us are savable without you and your word. And we praise you. Lord, work in our lives this week and every week. In your name, amen. And our closing hymn is 435.